Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Bible Institute on Tuesdays. <clears throat> and after you were uh, absent for a spell, we thought we had a conference that went very well with Pastor Evangelist Eric Opal Melwani. So we give God thanks to the man of God who came. Let us to those nights of worship which focus on healing and deliverance. Tonight, we resume our studies in the book of Galatians. We'll be picking up at Galatians chapter 5. So this week, <coughs> my intention is to finish chapter 5, and then next week, we'll complete our study of the book of Galatians by looking at chapter 6. So we give God time to get led us to our, our conversations on the book of Galatians. I hope it's been helpful to you. Uh, tonight we speak about freedom and what God has set us free from um, in regards to grace and <clears throat> theology of redemption through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're going to open with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to ask um, Pastor Reva to tell someone to read Galatians 5 in the NIV from verses 1 to the end. And then we begin our conversation and discussions on chapter 5. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace, your anointing, your presence in our lives. We thank you for how you continue to lead and guide us day by day. We thank you even now as we enter new times, uh, changing times, that you are still the God who leads and directs our lives. We thank you for your faithfulness demonstrated to the people in the earth, uh, even now. <clears throat> We come against every distressing uh, thought that clouds our minds, that take our mindset of what you taught us in your word. We continue to look with hope and expectation, and also with excitement, um, concerning the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that there are signs that signal to us that we are living in um, these are the last days. May we not grow weary, may we not faint, may we not quit. Um, may we learn to persevere and by faith and patient endurance uh, obtain the promise that you've given us in your Holy Scriptures. We pray for illumination. We pray for you to anoint our eyes with fresh revelation. We also ask you to anoint our ears so that we can hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying expressly to the church, um, even now in this season. We ask you also to guide our hearts and to guide us in the Lord Jesus by the covenant and the power of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells in us as your servants and your children, sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise God. Good evening. Reading from Galatians chapter 5 in the NIV version. If it's for freedom that Christ has set us free, stand firm then and do not, <clears throat> do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness of which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut it on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I am still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. 
life by the Spirit. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbors as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fit of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, fractions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to, the, to Christ Jesus have circum, circumcised the flesh with his passions and has, have crucified, sorry, the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Yeah. May God have enriched the blessing this work. Um, two weeks ago, we ended up our conversation about freedom. And that freedom begets freedom of, of this kind. And Paul um, established and drove home this message by comparing the child of Hagar, who was the bond servant, and we know that her child was a descendant of Abraham, with Sarah's child was the promised son Isaac, and, and Sarah being the free woman. So Abraham is the originator of both children, but one was subject to bondage and one was subject to freedom. And he actually said that those of us who are born uh, through the true grace, um, the unmerited favor of God, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins, are the children of Sarah. And we are the ones who will um, fill the new Jerusalem, which is coming down from heaven. And so he was making it clear that the Jews, even though they were sons of Abraham, they were born under bondage. And that you cannot, uh, you cannot achieve freedom from bondage. So he's saying you have to establish freedom from freedom. So freedom begets freedom, bondage leads to more bondage. And so that was the message that we had um, that we used. And it probably was an offense to the Jews because the Amazons of the descendants of Sarah who then seen themselves being aligned with Hagar, who was the bond, bond slave. Or she was a servant in Abraham's house who became his concubine. And so that's where we ended up about freedom. And so we began to see that Paul is making freedom. And that's why we, we entitled this study, Set Free um, to Live. Uh, Paul is basing his whole conversations about freedom and establishing that freedom is the foundation of our Christian faith. Uh, Christ came to liberate us and to set us free. And he did so by freeing us from a yoke. And he calls the law what? What does he refer to the law as in Galatians 5 and 1? A yoke of bondage. He actually makes even a, a more stronger language, slavery. You know, so he saw as, as, as an oppressive agency that brings us onto a yoke. And a yoke was actually like a wooden arch that was placed upon the neck of animals uh, to bring them to alignment. And we know Jesus Christ used it in a positive sense to say, take my yoke upon me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But generally when Paul is using the word yoke here, he's talking about this arch uh, piece of wood that's placed on the neck of defeated persons. And so he's saying the law was actually something that was placed upon you and more is symbolic of this oppressive agency that is being placed upon your neck of someone who was defeated. It didn't liberate you. It, it more constrained you. It brought you into obligation um, that actually um, brought you into a, another level of bondage. Only Christ 
he's saying only Christ um, actually is the one who made you free. And after Christ has made you free, to go back into the law is actually resubmitting, rededicating, replacing or repositioning yourself back under this yoke of bondage that he calls <clears throat> slavery. And there are several um, things that Paul saw of, of, um, also resembling that, that level of bondage as well, and we're going to speak about it because he, he highlights them as well, in, as well in chapter five. But he's now here focused on the law. And so the Miriam Webster is what defines the yoke as an oppressive agency, as a device that's laid on the neck of a defeated person. And use the imagery of um, slavery to highlight the severity of exchanging our covenant of grace. So when, when you use language like that, he's trying to say to go back and to trying to keep these obligations was no light matter. There was, it was no light matter. He even went further to say that if you begin to practice circumcision in order to be right with God, in order to be saved or to be redeemed or to be, be put in right standing with God, if you begin observing the Sabbath for the same purpose as to be made right with God, to, um, to be in a right relationship with God, he said that's almost like um, being alienated from Christ and falling away from grace. And the reason he said that is that he didn't see any of what he was trying to show them. But he said, oh, you have to be circumcised out of a right relationship with God. That wasn't the end of the story. Uh, if you keep the Sabbath, you'll be made right with God. That wasn't the right of the story. He didn't see that as the end of the redemption. Like how we say, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. Right? That's what we preach. And so salvation is completed once you believe in your heart and confess that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. If you believe in the dead, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. End of story. Um, he was saying to them, when you begin to apply circumcision and Sabbath, while they're making the scene like that's the end of it, once you do that, you have a right relationship with God. It's actually the beginning of all the other obligations. Because to enter that door of practicing circumcision to be right with God, even keeping the Sabbath, he said, then you're now making yourself obligated to keep all of the law. And it's to keep all of the law all of the time, every day of the week. And he showed us before what was the success rate of keeping the law. Uh, what was the success rate of keeping the law? No. Zero. Zero. Nil. And so he's saying, you know, we have a system where we all fail. We, we are trying to place on these new Gentile believers. Things that we and our forefathers, forefathers, I mean, like even the, the ancient ones who first got it couldn't keep. You know, we see them keep falling away, going to bondage, being led into slavery, being sent into foreign nations to be punished for their sins. They couldn't keep it. And so he's saying, when you get circumcised, that's not the end of the story. Yeah, maybe saying you get circumcised and then you're right with God. He said, then all of a sudden now you're obligating yourself to do everything else the law requires. <clears throat> Did you see? Do you see that? And so he's cautioning us about exchanging our covenant of grace, exchanging our unmerited favor for any other basis which requires from us human effort as a means of saving ourselves from the wrath of God. Circumcision and keeping the Sabbath, those are good things, but they are not an end in themselves. And they will only serve to bring the new believers under the complete system of keeping all of the Mosaic law. He says, you who are working to be justified by the law is obligated to keep all of it. So you just can't um, cherry pick. You just can't cherry pick one thing in the law to keep. And then when you keep that, says, oh, I'm justified. That's what Paul is saying. You just can't cherry pick because <laughs> Moses was the one who wrote the law. He said, if you, if you fail to keep any one of them, you fail all. So <laughs> Moses' idea of, of, his, of the system that God gave him was that you have to be perfect. Meaning that if you kept all nine and you failed in, in number 10, he says you have you, you failed the other. It's a, a it's a weird way of grading. Well, I don't know if our teachers grade like that, but you pretty much if you fail one class, that was it. Yeah. And, and that's how could you imagine having a success rate in other areas of your life? Like that guy who came to Jesus and he said to Jesus, I've kept them all, I've not have adultery, I've not kept fornication. And Jesus looked at him and smiled and said, Okay. Because you were dealing with the spirit of greed, not having any other God before me, the God of materialism. He says, go and sell everything you value and come and follow me. Make me your priority. 
And what did he do? That was commandment one. He went away <laughs> sorrowful. And a lot of people don't see the point, but the point was um, God says, Thou shalt have no other God ahead of me, before me, besides me. That is, have anything that's a priority above God, anything that even equals Him in terms of our devotion and service. And when He couldn't give up any, He couldn't give up what He had in terms of other possessions to follow God in the flesh, who was the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus looked at Him and said, you thought you were winning, but you were losing. Because you couldn't keep the very first one, which asks for your, your absolute devotion to God above all else. And the Bible says, went away sorrowful. And guess who else felt sorrow for him? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. God, God. Because God, like, sincerely, he wants to do well. He wants, he wants to win, um, but he was failing. Um, I just wonder, like, why were they chosen as a as a way if it was like yeah, in another place Paul said it was actually placed on us to guide us to the truth yeah, right. so it was like a schoolmaster schoolmaster same thing speaks of slavery yes it, wasn't, it says school but in other terms like a taskmaster it was to keep us on track so that he could drive us to the truth or guide us to the truth and 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 what you're asking was also known by God because from Genesis, God spoke of his redemption through the sacrificial giving of life and the shedding of blood. And it was Moses himself who gave the law, who also said that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Right. So they have to keep on bringing this up. So they were doing every, yeah, that's why they had to have continual sacrifice. They were trying to replicate what only the blood of Jesus Christ could have done. That was Hebrew said that because they were imperfect, they had to keep trying to measure perfection by continual sacrifice. But when Christ died, he, he, he tore the veil and, and, and make it obsolete because now the perfect replaced the imperfect. Is it making sense? Yeah. And that's important because we live in a day still to understand it, that people try very subtly and I'm talking about human effort to bring in the yoke of, of bondage. And it's not that like these things in themselves is bad. That's why sometimes we have all of these arguments and we don't do a bit of argument, but somebody tell you that you must wear clothes that reaches the ground to be saved. It's wrong. To say wear clothes that covers you because it looks appropriate. <laughs> it's more, it, it is more, whatever we want to say, you know, as we teach and instruct people, it is more comely, more reflective of godly attire. That's different, but to make it a requirement for salvation, that's human effort. So then you have people all their lives doing it. You have other times people say, oh, you have to be dressed in white every day. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, we, we laugh, but and they yes. and and they when you talk to them, they say they're, they're believers, they're Christians, but you see the bondage that they've been placed under, and the bondage does not liberate them. Paul says, if God set you free, why are you allowing people to enslave you to something that doesn't work? Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about holiness and righteousness because some people, and Paul dealt with it in this same chapter, then tend to use that as a, a license to, to indulge in sin. And that's not, he said, that's not what I'm teaching. What I'm defending is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that was given to us by Jesus himself and also supported by the ancient prophets because they all spoke of redemption right down to Moses himself, spoke about there was a better way and that he himself was looking towards the future when the Messiah would come. So Moses himself was looking for redemption from a Messiah, from a person. And that, that is important for us to understand. He says, on the redemption by grace, that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. What does he mean? <clears throat> In another place, he said, the only obligation we have is to love. So here he's got that faith in God and the finished work of redemption and is expressing itself to love. What, what does Paul make a reference to? Yes. Turn with me to Mark 12, verses 30 and 31.
And what does what does Jesus teach us in, in, in that that in that thing? And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The second is equally important of your neighbor, but of yourself. No other commitment is greater. No other commandment is greater than these. So Jesus is saying the greatest commandments is what? Love. That's why he said it. By this shall all men know. If you can reach to that level of love, you have reached the highest command there is. So all the others are minor. In fact, if he, he excludes them, he's saying, if you want to really get into the majors, love God and love your neighbors. All the other stuff, so all those are minor commands. You really want to master your faith? Let your faith be expressed through love. Love of God and love of our neighbor. Very simple. Now in terms of application, how, how easy or hard is it to do it? <laughs> well, it, it technically covers all the rest. So if you love God, then you won't do the other ones. So you still technically got to keep all the rest of them anyway. So there's an umbrella for all the rest. That's very good. Um, how about loving our neighbor? <laughs> if you love God, <laughs> then you love your neighbor. If you love God. In fact, that's how we show our love for God. God said, how oh, can you love God whom you haven't seen if you can't love someone who's created in your limits? I mean, loving your neighbor thing is, is very vague. No, no, it's very clear. It's very clear. <laughs> but you sit down there. It's it's very, very clear. clear. <laughs> we, 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 the problem in the evangelical church is because we don't want to love other people. And, and I want to stay here because a lot of times we, we are so busy telling people how to keep all the minor commands, but we, we dodge the big one. Love other people. Love God, love other people. See, we I find every that. excuse not to love people. The way the Bible says to love people. True or false? I don't think it's a matter of not wanting to. I think it has a lot to do with not knowing how to. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You're yeah. I, 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 I'm open, I'm open. How, okay, how would so, you so let me that? give you an example. Yeah. So, Let's let's look at no offense because yeah. I have Caribbean parents, yeah. But let's look at how our Caribbean parents brought us up. I can't tell you that every day I was embraced by a hug and a kiss, but I, I knew that my parents loved me. But in terms of sure. them saying I love you and showing the affection, that was not regular in our life. So now I grew up not knowing how to express love. And I'm being very honest. And it, I mean, it was my very good friend, Brother Terrence, who actually showed me that it's okay. Because I remember the first time we had a conversation, well, not the first time, but when he said, I love him, I was like, the heck, he can love me. I really live like brother and sister. But that's because I didn't know. So it took a while for me to be able to express. So sometimes it's 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 what you know, and of course you have to be taught. <clears throat> no, after you get to that point and you just decide, well, I, I can take she and take or take him, then that's a difference. But I think sometimes the root could actually be lack of knowledge as to how to <coughs> to love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's a very good point. I want to think Christ as he came, and that's why he spent so much time teaching us about what love is and what it looks like, is um, because he knows, both from cultural, both from past experience, both sometimes you know that a lot of us are coming out of hard positions. There are people actually coming out of environments or life experiences that have made them hard into love. And God understands that. That's why I think he's so relentless in loving people, because he realized not everybody's going to understand the love of God that he's expressing to the world that it could be foreign to them. That love could be like a, a foreign concept or notion based on the life experiences you've had. Also, there's love and discipline because the Bible whom God loves, he corrects. And a lot of people think letting children do what they want is love. It, 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 it correction is love. 
even in within the church, biblical love requires correction. Because um, he said, if you see a brother who's erring a sinning, you have a responsibility to go to him quietly and rebuke him so he, he could be delivered. So, so just to say to you, you know, I think when it's not balanced and that's all renewal is punitive, then, then you're right. We, we were not given a balanced perspective of how to receive, how to show love and also how to receive it. Right. And I think receiving it is just as difficult as showing it. Someone have a problem showing love. And trust me, some people have a problem receiving love. To this day, there are people, when you go to hug them, they do not rely on their body language. They actually cold. They have to put their shoulders and start pushing you off of the elbow. And I experienced that all the time. And I smiled because I knew it's not me they rejected. It's just they, they want to be loved. They, they appreciate being shown love, but they don't know how to receive love. But this is the greatest command. It's the one that God wants us to master. He says, this, this, this will show the world that you have my heart. If you love God and you love others as you love God, there's no greater commandment than these. And that's what Paul alluded to as Sister Raka said. What she said is true that, that faith expresses itself to love. What I've been saying is if you love God, then all the other stuff becomes easy. You know, the first thing people ask you when you do anything that offends them or other, they say, I taught you love me. They never said, I thought I told you not to do that. They always be father. I taught you love me. Because I feel if anything should have stopped you from doing what you did, it would have been your love for me. And God is the same way. If you love me, God is saying, your love for me should have ordered and directed your steps. Yeah, but um, so true. <clears throat> the, the thing is, is because there's so many different ways you can express love, then you could go on the flip side of that and say, if you don't know hatred, but you don't know how to express love, does that mean you don't love? <clears throat> it, I know it's not very complicated, right? But if I don't know how to hate somebody, like you say you got not shown love, but if you want shown hate, either your lack of not telling somebody you love them or showing them you love them physically doesn't mean that you don't love them. So for you to tell me that you love me or that you don't love me based on my interaction with you or lack thereof could go both ways. I could love you, right? But because I don't love you, I don't want a bad attitude about you <clears throat> to upset me <clears throat> and avoid you. So you look so you look from <laughs> I'm just no I, I think you just said be free. So all of you are not praying and avoiding God. I mean I'm yeah. just I'm the same I'm, I'm saying wisdom. This, would you say the love? So what I'm saying is I could love you, right? But I I don't have to I don't have to I comment your presence, do I have to do, but I don't have to stay there. Does that mean I don't love you? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> you Does guys, that mean I don't love you? You guys think of an addition. Uh, so what, what, what would be your impression? If I'm a caring person, right? So I like to interact with people. So if you try and avoid me, I might think you don't love me. But if I wasn't that interactive <clears throat> with you, I wouldn't take you not interacting with me as like how I would interact with somebody that I am around all the time. And the same, how you interact with Brother Terrence at a different level of love is different than how you would interact with somebody else that you don't have that bond with to spend more than 10 minutes with at a time. But avoidance so is in, not a lack of love. I could be avoiding you because of guilt. Maybe I may have said something or done something and I just... <laughs> To shame, to actually have you address it, so I, I will avoid you. Like students, they do your work, and they see you, and they're avoiding you. So avoidance don't necessarily mean lack of love, though. I'm, 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 okay, I have a family member that I used to chill out with all the time. <clears throat> but their life, their life path, and my life path is two different life paths. So that's guilt. So that's not guilt. That's guilt on their part. They, no, they no, know the I, truth. No, I choose oh, to okay. avoid spending time with them like I used to 
because we are no longer on the same walk of life. So like, I don't like want. Pastor Carl's message. Yeah, you just, <laughs> yeah, you're just <laughs> you're number one. It doesn't mean you don't love them. No, but I still go around them, but I don't spend. I when I hey, what's up? We talk to me. I think go there, man. Daddy good, man. We go there. Your cousin good. Okay, bye. So you're not told a boy that they're, you're actually not hanging out I'm with them. Yeah, yeah, that amount of time, them. but they might look at it as avoiding them. So yeah. that's what I'm saying. It could be a matter of perspective. Somebody would go and say, Pastor Carl, but I can no love me because he's always avoiding me. <clears throat> they know that I spent 15 minutes with them. All they notice is that I didn't spend an hour with them when cousin Susie just tell them, but I can spend three hours with me yesterday. But we know. Um... We know this whole concept of love even came from the heart of Moses. Because the first time it was said was Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength. And we keep seeing him emphasize the word all there. So we know that love wasn't just something that started with the Gospels, that is, even from the very beginning, Moses spoke about it. And so it's driving the conversation. Two ways that we are told we love God, both by the Lord Jesus Christ and the Gospel of John 14 and 1 John 5 and 3. He says, when we keep his commandments, and so you're right. So God says, faith expressing itself to love. When you love God, you're going to obey him. You're going to keep his commandments. And that obligation of love is what causes us to keep his commandments. So we're not doing it, and it's not burdensome to us because now it's, it's an internal motivation where we want to do it. Because it pleases God. Is that making a difference? Does that make sense? So you could be doing the same thing, but he says when it's an external motivation where you are doing it to avoid punishment or uh, uh, it's punitive, then, then it's not love. But when you express your faith by loving God and doing as he commands us to do, both the Lord Jesus Christ and 1 John 5, 3, then he says that's how we show we love God. Another way we show we love God is by loving others. So actually, when we're loving other people, we're actually expressing our love for God. Do we actually see that way in the evangelical church? Do you see yourself as loving God when you love others? In the long run, yes, not initially. Yeah, have the car preach on that something will avoid us. Yeah, not initially. Um, we asked the question, I said not initially. We don't normally see loving people as loving God. Initially, we yeah. see them as two separate things. But God actually made them one. He said the way you, you show your love for God by loving others. Loving and loving other believers. And so God sees his ability to influence the world through us is by us loving other people. And we the very when we look at it, we love God, then because we love him. We obey. We do not do things, even things that is not directly within his word. We don't do things that we think that would offend him in so him. We avoid. That same way we love, we ought to love one another, the others. That the love we have for the individuals, individual persons, will enable us or should enable us to avoid being cruel to them, to avoid having them in such any way, to avoid. You know, doing the things which we know is going to offend or set them on news, set and set the grace. So it's basically going the same way. Because this we love God, we obey him, we walk in his in his statutes and so on. We love people, then we are very careful to be good to them. You know, in every so because we love people individuals, we cannot be rough and harsh and cruel. To them, we cannot destroy their property <coughs> because we love it, or steal their property, or you know, do this kind of wrongs to them because of the love we have for them. Yeah. So if you're going to go wrong stealing people's things and mashing up people's stuff, you can't say you love individuals after all, you, you don't. <laughs> but you know, that doesn't make that's the way it goes. So so love is a very powerful ingredient in our lives, and, and it, dry, it drives us to, to, to do a whole lot of good if we allow it to. Now, can I? Does God see love the same way we in the world see love? Is biblical love when we speak about it? Because that's sometimes we get lost because we love is used in so many contexts. But when God's speaking about love from a biblical context, is He speaking about love the same way we are talking about love? No. That love for one is unconditional. 
they love, love, they love until you give me a reason not to love you. <laughs> Sometimes you have to have a witness of it. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're actually saying is our love is based on conditions and feelings. 99 feelings. Of the time. And so our love varies based on my feelings for you today. I could be in love with you. Based on my feelings about you tomorrow, it's I could like be out of love with you. Just like you. And then by Wednesday, depending on what you do again, <laughs> I could be back in love with you. You know, by Friday, Mother's Day, and everybody gets a bouquet, I could be out of love with you. <laughs> So just start saying, hey, I'm, I'm in life with you. I'm in love with you. So we see that with God, love is considered to be steadfast. And the other thing we see about love is every time he tells us to love, it's a command. Yeah. Think about it. Every time God tells us to love, he commands us to love. If it's based on a feeling, he wouldn't be commanding us to love. So biblical love is an act or a decision to do something. So, is that making sense? Yeah. So when God commands us to love, it's, a, it's an act, it's a decision. It's something that he says that you can choose to do out of your will, not out of a feeling. That's a good question, John from Sweetheart. I can answer. She said, is that the same as you can forgive but not reconcile? You love them, but you don't want to be in their presence because of their behavior and ability? And yes, that's true. Forgiveness has nothing to do with reconciliation. Um, when we talk about forgiveness, it's about letting go of offenses and not allowing roots of bitterness to grow within you because it affects your relationship with others as well as your relationship with God. But it's not advocating that you um, continue to support, condone, encourage, or allow a culture for the same behavior um, to continue. So you are right. Um, forgiveness. Uh, from a biblical standpoint, is not advocating uh, acceptance of unfavorable conditions or treatment that are abusive. In fact, the same scripture we talk about, somebody was so nice to remind me about the avoid association, someone that was so beautiful articulated on Sunday. Uh, one of the people that God told us to avoid is abusive, yeah. abusive yeah. people. So that was clear. It says if you are abusive, you know, avoid, abuse, in terms of hanging up with it, because you are concerned that even as believers, they can affect our behavior. And Paul says, he says um, bad companionships or bad friendships corrupt good morals. So and so that was, that was a concern. A lot of Christians believe that you could be so anointed that none mm -hmm. in the world can influence mm -hmm. you, but that's not true. You hang out with um, <laughs> secular people, womanizers, mm -hmm. no matter how strong you're on your faith, eventually that those companionships will affect your good morals. And even though you are a good moral are righteous persons, you may, you may begin to be influenced by that behavior. In fact, Proverbs says that by being friends with an ill-tempered or a bad-tempered person, you can set a snare, a trap for your soul. And so they actually see that um, allowing yourself to hang around certain environments, you are actually opening yourself to certain, to certain vices or snares for your soul, your emotional being, and he wants against that. And so that's why we speak about there are certain things you avoid to set yourself up for success in terms of living up your faith. <clears throat> Did that answer your question, Sister, Sister Hodge? Anyone else? So we see that, that love is yes, a command. Yes, sorry, sorry, yes. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Love is a command, and that is the hardest thing. When you say faith expresses itself to love, even worship is an expression of faith in love. And one of the things, um, David, who was a master worshiper who pursued the heart of God, he once spoke about the sacrifice of praise. And a lot of believers don't understand that because we are too driven by feelings. We show love and we feel like it. We show kindness when we feel like it. People actually vindicate, but Pastor Carl, I'm feeling it, you know? And we that just by thing. And I, I, you know, you call it praying fast, but right now I ain't feeling it. So I'm going to eat till I start feeling like fat. You will never feel it. <laughs> that was a command. And you will never feel about worship. So they're going to God's presence and because of all that the devil tried to do in your week. You say, I just don't feel it. I, you know. um, but love is a command. And faith expresses itself to love because God commands us to love. And the reason God can command us to love him and to love others, because he is worthy. He is do that. You know, when you require something, is because you deserve that. God is worthy of the things he asks us to do. 
So he, he said that we are to give him sacrifice of praise because he's worthy of that. When he talks about we are to love him, and by loving him, we keep his commands, he's worthy of, he's deserving of that. He's deserving of that, and he knows his value. And so that's why he's saying here is that love is something that comes out of our will. It's intentional. It comes out of, out of our, the will of our beings. And it's not subject to our feelings, which goes up and down. I mean, we talked about it just now. Uh, it can change based on circumstances, right? And the same thing when we define happiness with joy. Where does joy come from? From the spirit. Where does happiness come from? From the spirit. From circumstances. Why today I'm happy? Somebody just give me fifty dollars. Or why did I feel too good? This happened. My car breaks down. It's different than joy. Because the Bible that we can have joy even in difficult circumstances. So we see there's, there's fruits of the spirit that flows internally from within. And one of the things that actually can be expressed by our obedience to God and acts of our will is love. And holiness and righteousness is, is faith expressing itself to love. And that's what the scriptures teach us. And so when Paul is talking about um, this freedom from bondage and the freedom from the law, he's not excluding us from living righteous lives. He's not excluding us from walking in integrity. And he's going to go on to deal with that later as Pastor Reba um, Retorist, that a lot of people after they read the first part, they stop and say, oh, then I have a license to do what I want because <laughs> if I'm required to do that, I'm required to do that, hey, then I'm free to do whatever. And Paul says, that is not how that is to be applied and that is not how that's to be interpreted. Um, the Bible actually gives us a couple of guidelines for how we have to love others that I want to share with you. He says when we love others, we will be a friend. Proverbs 17, 17. He says we will be a friend who loves at all times. Underline at all times. We will be a friend who loves how? Okay. At all times. What is he saying about loving at all times? What is God say, saying about us? This command to love people at all times. What is God saying about this love that he's placed in our heart? The same love that God has to us. That is not conditional. Um, so God is saying that you and I, believe it or not, are capable of unconditional love. Do you believe you are capable of unconditional love? Yeah. Capable. Yeah. Do we do it? <laughs> Thank you, Sister Rekha, for highlighting we are capable of it. The potential is in us. And, and it is in us because God said, I will not ask you for anything that you're not capable of. And that's why with the marriage vow, some people want to change it and say, well, we don't live up to it, so just let's change it. Some people don't like um, to love church and obey. They, they edit that out. Some people write their own <laughs> own vows. I'm going to tell you something. I write their own vows so loose and it leaves them right to failure within five years. But our covenant love expressed our marriage say for better or worse. And that's what description is to love in all time, to love at all times. Does that make sense? And so we, according to the record, is capable of loving at all times. And he's asking us that when we love others, is to be a friend who stick it closer than a, a brother or a brother to stick it closer, or a brother born for adversity. He just say a friend that stick it closer than a brother. It's through tick and tin. He's talking about being there for support and encouragement. So that's the first thing that how we can love others. The other way is to treat others how you like to be treated. So I want us to turn to two scriptures. One is actually found in Galatians 16. But could we turn to Matthew 22 and 9 b But Jesus said, you should love your neighbor as you love your Matthew 22 to the 9 b You should you should treat others as you would like to be treated. And you know, to this day, that's hard. Some people, because of cultural upbringing, some sometimes because of training, sometimes because of experiences, we have not learned how to treat people like we would like to to be treated ourselves. And God said that that's what you do the same way you like for others to treat you. That's how you treat them. What are some of the ways that we can actually practice that? Uh, when we give to others, we shouldn't just give things that are so like run down. Like if you have a bunch of like toys, and if you wouldn't 
use your toys yourself because they're all run down, um, then I don't think that you should give something to others that that you wouldn't use yourself unless it's actually in good condition and stuff like that. But yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah. When, when we're doing Chris, Christmas exchange, you pick my name. <laughs> <laughs> I love your answer. <laughs> but you are right. Some people uh, say repurpose. I mean, there's some really nice gifts people have put aside and never use it, and they have good value. Um, we're not talking about that. But honestly, you should not um, you should not give away things on the pretext pretext of being generous that you wouldn't wear yourself. There was one time they actually wrote a story about a president who gave some underwear that was used uh, to the Salvation Army <laughs> uh, to get a tax rate out. Uh, it was a big story, but I'm not going to call it if I remember it clearly. But they, they made a big deal about how these things were so tattered and toned, you know, and that it wouldn't be something you give um, to someone else. And it just goes to show the mindset in the it world. I think it made it because, one, one. because, <laughs> because he was president. But I'm just saying uh, what, what our young sister said is so true. Uh, we have to be so careful how we treat others, even people who work for us, even people who are around us, and not making them feel less than, uh, like uh, there's a, a class system you know, you must eat up, you know, we have to be so careful. And it can even happen in the large church. Paul actually talked about preferential treatment. How when you have governors come in, then you make special seating for them. Oh, but then other people come in and there's no regard, acknowledgement for them. Paul says, don't let impartiality and come into the large church. You should treat everyone as if they were special because by doing so, you will entertain angels. So they actually have to believe that everyone was special to God. <laughs> and, and, and particularly as we are, and then as Alia mentioned, the way we, we treat others. I see it a lot with the, the homeless people. Even, you know, your, those people or some of us that we cook to give to the homeless, we don't put our all in it. Presentation. So, right. So when you see the plate, it looks like, yeah. Rubbish. Yes. <laughs> and when in fact, well, thank you, Holy Spirit. Maybe some. Okay. No, you, you say it. Yeah. We're, so we're, when, we're, when in fact we know that that's not how we would cook for ourselves. Okay. It's like Alia said, they're beneath us, so we just don't put our eye in it. And to me, if you, if you can treat them or love them as you would yourself, and I guess it goes back to the same verse: love your neighbor as yourself, then we shouldn't do it at all. So I I, I applaud Alia for that illustration. You know, sometimes you hesitate to share things because this happened to me when we went out as a church. Dr. Judah Hart wanted us to go out and give, give baskets uh, to the homeless one Christmas. And I actually remember this because I was very impressed with Brother Aaron Roach and Craig, who's here, as well as the gifts that was put together. When I opened the bag, because it was the first time I was seeing the bag that we hand them out, everything in the bag was new, including the towels. Yes. I, I saw labels on there like they actually bought them from the store. The shampoos, the everything that you thought about, the toothbrush, the toothpaste, and it actually moved me. That what we put together was everything brand new. I could have gone home one of those baskets and used everything in that bag. And then the other thing I saw is like where we couldn't get it to the people because it was away from us. Instead of throwing it to them and there was mud and garbage on there and the gut, I saw with a new pair of shoes, so I thought we new, I saw Craig and Aaron got down in the gut so they could hand them in their hands. And I watched that and I said, a proud moment. I felt proud being the, the pastor of the people doing it because it was done the right way with that spirit of excellence. And we have to always be mindful of that because it speaks volumes both to the people we're doing it for and other people who are watching. Correct. You know, it Correct. actually makes a statement as to how we are loved. And, and that's so important. So I thank you, Alia. That was a beautiful story. And uh, you must have an amazing pastor. <laughs> <laughs> no credit to the parents, just uh, <laughs> just my one Sunday for two hours. You're doing an amazing job. So um, 
But no, thank you so much. Still having a little fun. Um, but we give God thanks for your response and your heart. And the, that always be cultivated in you um, as well. And, and real, real good example as to what it would be. And so that's how God wants us to treat others. Let's turn to Galatians 6 and 10. And let's see what Galatians 6 and 10 says about how we can love others. And we're going to be going to chapter 6 next week. Let us not grow weary, while doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially those who are the household. Amen. Let us not grow weary doing good to each other. Let us not grow weary being kind to each other. He says, guess what? There's a harvest associated with doing good, especially those who are the household of faith. Don't grow weary doing it. Sometimes you grow weary. You know how you could get weary? Is that sometimes the enemy allows you to do it first for people who are not grateful. <laughs> and now they say, you know what? I'm I done with this man. <laughs> and, and he said, don't let, don't let ingratitude discourage you from doing good. You know what I'm saying? Continue to do good. Because remember, don't fry Peter and Paul's fat. There's other people who's going to benefit from you being good. And just remember, there, there is a blessing associated with doing good, especially to those who are the household of faith. So yeah, as I said, there's a preference for those who are in the faith, but it means also that those who are not of the faith is also included in us doing good as well. Is that making sense? Yeah. Um, the next way he told us to do it is by sharing each other's burdens, is how we show love. So we're loving God by being friends, treating each other's how we like to be treated, sharing each other's burdens. Could we turn to Galatians 6, 2 and 3? What does Galatians 6, 2 and 3 says? Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Yeah. So he says we, we should, and because he's saying helping someone else is actually very humbling. It, it also, we're discovering when it's inconvenient. You know, it's not that we don't have a heart to help other people. Most things when we're asking about other people, it's technically sometimes very inconvenient. And that's when we kind of chase at doing it because like, okay, we're pressed for time. I have other things that I want to get to. And he says, you know, then we start thinking about what's important to us. But he says, helping other people is, is, is equally important. And so when you become so important that you don't have the time or don't want to avail yourself to help other people, he's saying you're fooling yourself. You're not that important. Because the reason God may have brought them to your life is for you to be the heart of God to that person. So he's saying, you know, actually take advantage of it, you know. Is that making sense? I see a lot of nods on the I can't see you guys in, uh, streaming on live. I, I pray your father and his helping. And then he says, when we love each other, we're going to build each other up. You know, the, the, the scriptures actually talks a lot about us elevating each other, making each other better, building each other up. He says, and not tearing each other down. Paul actually says in this scripture, he says, if you keep doing it, you're going to devour and destroy each other. Because the whole concept of love, having the love that God has for us, is to build each other up in the most holy faith. And he gave us several scriptures to talk about that. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpened iron. And so here we are, iron, passion against each other. I should be making you better. But guess what? You should be making me better as well. And people don't, don't see that. You know, some people believe that this is like a one-way street, especially apostles and, you know, those characters say, they don't see the church as being there to make them better. And that's why some of them live like they are unaccountable to anyone. But we are accountable to each other, especially leaders. Leaders are more accountable to the church. He says, because if you lead, as so, so much as a small child astray, he said it would be more, it would be better for you to tie a spoon around your neck and go drunk yourself. Mm. So I am I'm accountable to every child who comes in, in to live home. So it's not about me just living for myself. I have to think about every person when they hear Pastor Carl did X Y Z, it will cause them to stumble in their faith, and them stumbling in their faith is attributed to me. Is that making sense? That applies only to children. Apply that does to. <laughs> so no, I'm I'm asking because sometimes you may hear somebody say, 
but I don't go there anymore because such and such offended me. And it doesn't have to be in church. It could be any organization. And then I might say, you, you really get up out that personal power? But that's me. I, I just different. So I may look at it as you're giving a person the power to control you as to not attending. But no, based on what you're saying, it could be a situation where you're causing somebody to stumble. So what really is it? I, I think the scripture is one of us and tell us we have to be very careful. And that's where, again, loving your neighbor, you have to show consideration. A lot of times we don't do things because it's that wrong and gonna send you to hell. But he says, if you have weaker brethren who sees it as a problem, he says, then you have to be careful not to do it. Yeah. So for instance, I, I may not think there's anything wrong with going to mountaintop and having a banana daiquiri. You know, I'm happy to wait and make it. It's a cultural drink. I ain't gonna have to get drunk. I have one, I get in my car and I drive. You know, somebody else may see that as, as, as a unpardonable sin. Like, oh my God, you're drinking alcohol because it has, you know, he drips with alcohol. And all of a sudden that's an offense thing. Guess what happens? You, for you, you know, if you drink it, you don't go in hell. You're fine. But if you see that brother start backing away from the counter and looking at you, like you, you just got like horns on your head, you're causing him to stumble. You got to say, you know, I'm sorry. Could you change my drink? Make it a virgin. Because all of a sudden, Paul says, you have to consider it weaker brother. And that's in everything. That's in everything we do. Yeah, I know it's hard, but this is what we're talking about love. Uh, love is saying, listen. If I'm going to a particular place, uh, McDonald's is okay with me because, but for somebody else, it causes them to stump them. I'm going to stop eating McDonald's. And But then that goes back to what you <laughs> said earlier about being in bondage, though. So now I am in bondage because... Faith, <laughs> faith expresses itself in love. The only <laughs> obligation God said we have is to love. Love is an obligation. Obligation is technical bond, but one that we choose out of love, right? I, I'm in bondage to Reba. If I'm out a certain time, Reba called me a technique, where are you now? Does that sound like freedom? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying, but that's an obligation of love. Oh, I said, sorry, babes. I'm generally home at this time. I stopped by Giant Gas. I'm telling you a reason. I stopped by Giant Gas. I just dropped the pastor home. He wanted food. I'm on back street. I'm not getting gas, and I'm coming right home. Then it's safety. <laughs> Help your sister right here. You tend to have a lot say, of insight. Help your sister. <laughs> Deliver me. I was going to say that uh, we need to make the distinction between intentionally hurting and causing someone to stumble as opposed to them being in their feelings about something that you have no idea Correct. that you even did or yeah. that, you know, so something as blatant as drinking mm -hmm. alcohol in front of someone, as you know what I'm saying, as your obligation to um, pass a river. That's something that is straightforward. You can see, you can address, you can fix. Right. But I think what um, Marita is referring to is more of the, oh, um, he, he says something, you know, just maybe something subtle that, you know, wasn't meant for anything and they're holding a grudge. Um, I think, that's, I think we need to just kind of make the distinction between the two because one is unforgiveness and lack of communication and the other one is intentionally causing your brethren to stumble. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, very good, that was very good. Thank you. Yeah, I no, 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 I'm going to make it complicated. I get my two hands up. <laughs> All right, Elder Paul. With this one. Get ready to record. Because, 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 because sometimes there are some petty people <clears throat> that everything bothers them. And personally, that will work on me with this. I will not let me a too. person control my life. Me too. To the point where if what I am doing is not sinful, I can't make you backslide if, you, if I'm sinning. <clears throat> Hear the difference? What is the sin in me slutting down a Big Mac <clears throat> that you don't like Big Mac? I'm just saying. I was just you, 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 you said McDonald's. You use pork. You use pork. <laughs> you said McDonald's. So I was I was doing that. All I'm saying is is you know okay. Let's use let's use a nice 
you know, pork chop. Me have a love me pork chop, you know. And when Sister Jennifer cooks me up a pork chop, Jennifer, and somebody around me that don't eat pork, condemn, right? Ah, no, no, no. Listen, I'm saying if I know you don't, if I know you're allergic to pork or you don't like pork touching you, that's different. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's just because you telling me I shouldn't eat pork because it's healthy for me at the time. And I see when I had a pork chop in four months, I want to enjoy my pork chop. You telling me that I must not eat my pork yeah, chop? <laughs> Paul said don't, don't I, do it. Thank I, you, Sister So what to do with my pork chop? <laughs> no, no, Paul, no. In love. Paul, remember the word obligation, <clears throat> Is a yoke. Jesus said, I take my yoke upon me, but my yoke is in my body love. And he said, the only thing that requires is faith expressing itself and love. Love is a yoke in us. Love limits how you speak, act, and behave, but it's not the same because it's flowing out of our um, submission to these things out of love for God and love for others. Yes, so that's, I was going to say, so I'm going to piggyback on that and say, it's not going to take anything out of you to not, you know, to just say, let me eat this later. You know, Craig don't like pork. Eat it later. So Craig don't like, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I know he hair. I know he don't, he into that. He don't take nothing out of me to put it on the side and do it later. That's not Craig control in my life. That's me just being considerate and yes. not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not <clears throat> offending him, even though it, it, it's nothing. To me, it's nothing. So then if it's nothing, then I'll save it for later. Yeah. You understand? Okay. And that's my point. So if, if, we're if, point right. that if, you, <laughs> if, if it truly <laughs> means nothing, it's not a save, it truly means nothing, then you would have no problem just putting it aside for later Delusion. or doing whatever, Praise you know what I'm God. saying, okay. out of the sight of whoever it's going to offend. Let, let if me, it means nothing, it means nothing. Let me give you an example. We have someone in our church, and we have done this before, and it affected all of our youth. We have a whole lot of children who have allergies to tree nuts. And when we start going to the list of all the snacks we bring, oh, this is a nut, oh, this is a, we just didn't bring. So everybody came under that obligation of love because we didn't want to have an episode with somebody in a bottle touch something. It, it's the same thing. And so, yes, it's limiting you for that night. But it doesn't mean that those snacks that I had to put back in the trunk of my car when I took them home, <laughs> no, I have to feed them to eat them. But that's, that's different. Friend. You're <laughs> talking about allergic <laughs> reaction. Yeah, the same finish. obligation of love. Let me, that, let me go back to you in the pork chop. Well, I, I have nothing <laughs> wrong with putting the pork chop <laughs> up, Pastor Carl. Pastor Carl, I'm not wrong with putting the pork chop up even for a week. But if you're gonna come in front of me and because you don't like pork chop, you pick my pork chop up and throw it in the garbage. Oh, <laughs> we got the problem. I'm just saying, <laughs> no, because now I'm offending my sister that cooked the pork chop for me. <laughs> okay, can, can we look for the scripture? We can't want to move on. We're far talking about how we, how we consider the sensibilities of younger believers because the whole thing is that we have to live our lives in a, in, in a godly way so that people don't stumble in their faith. And that's not because um, of any other yoke of bondage, but an obligation of love. Okay, that's Pastor that's Carl, wait, wait. Um, since, right. since we're on the pork chop ordeal, and I'm, I'm sensing that it is a, a, a touchy subject, do you agree that based on the Bible that we should not eat pork? Because if that's the case, I'm willing to oblige. But I just haven't seen anything stating that we shouldn't eat pork. And especially when God went ahead. And, and I probably need clarity on there's something in the Bible that says that God, that if anything that was unclean, God made it clean. I think I need clarity on that because people are, are, are viewing it differently. And so it's, 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 it's just kind of confusing. But I also look at the fact that the, that the Bible says that the body is a temple of God. So we have to watch what we eat. So if that's the case, Sister Reva is as a medical doctor, can some light be shed as to pork? Because, you know, you just don't want to say we're eating it and then really you shouldn't be eating it. So I, I just need some 
light shed on that just for clarification. Yeah, I'll let River deal with it because I think, like you say, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. God dwells in us. And so let's not just um, target folk. Let's just look at it from a holistic standpoint of anything that is detrimental to our physical person, to our bodies. God actually asks us out of our obligation of love. Not that we can't do that and send us to hell, but in terms of taking care of the temple in which God lives. And a lot of people have not taken care of the temple that God gave them, including men of God, and they have died prematurely. <laughs> people have gone home from preaching or went to go preach places and been found dead because of certain lifestyles. And that's not God killing them on assignment. That's <laughs> them killing themselves. And we have to be honest. And so, so when you start talking about pork, which we're going to talk about sugar, everything that is detrimental to your body, even not giving yourself proper sleep, you got, is going to fall within that preview because we have to start being honest and realize that we do have an obligation of love to God that even restrains what we do to ourselves. So the, um, there are two clarifications. The first one is that um, a lot of the statements that were made about these different animals and food they could eat and cannot eat was also based on a time when certain instruments of cooking, et cetera, was not available. So that could probably change it now. But um, it had to do with the way the animals digest their foods and whether or not they are cleaning the foods or just taking the scraps and keeping it in their body. And therefore, you're getting it. So <laughs> like, you would, like you would say, like those with the hoofs um, and the ones that chew the curd and don't chew the curd and that sort of stuff, because it has to do with the digestion mm -hmm. and whether or not by the time it gets, the meat gets to whether or not it would purify it or not. Um, so the same thing like with the lobsters and those shellfish that, that scavenger and they eat all the stuff at the bottom of the ocean. When you eat that now, you're getting all that's that, true. you know, stuff um, that they are eating. So so that's the, the whole point behind those restrictions. And um, now today we can say that we have pressure cooker that can cook it at whatever temperature and kill the germs that the pork might have still have in. Um, so you might want to use that just by today, but in general, like in Leviticus, I was trying to find like that scripture where you were talking was 11, yeah, but 11. Was 11. Yeah, it has a whole list of what you're allowed and what you're not. And you are allowed meats, but those are the ones that you're not because of the digestive system of the animal itself. So that's the really <laughs> truth. The truth okay. be told, when man was created, he was created, and this is where Jadam gets so perfect. Man was created to be a vegan. He was created to only because the first time an animal was killed was when man sinned. Yeah. Man, exactly. God was created in a context where there was no concept of the killing of anything. And then, and so the first one who shed blood was to make provision for man's sin was God. And that's why you get a concept of oh, the shedding of blood, there is no covering for sins, the consequence of sin. Because I don't know God to cover our nakedness where we felt vulnerable and shame to remove that vulnerability from us. He took the life of something and provided covering for us. Because the leaves were not adequate. Does that make sense? So that's where you get a whole concept of redemption in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And so when you, when, you, when you look at it in the reverse, then when God created man, it was to be a vegetarian. He, he said, every plant of the ground you can eat. He, he never said it. So then when Moses gave his life, he's making reference, okay, now you can eat. And they were doing it for a while. You can eat flesh, but as you're eating flesh, there are certain categories that are not wholesome. And so that had to do because it was scavengers, because of their purpose, all that had to do with the cost of how they chew their food or process their food. It didn't allow them to cleanse bacteria. Another saying, you know, some of those animals are raised in sterilized farms. But when they do go to some of those farms, the way those farmers do it, they're not oh. ethical. <laughs> they're, they're worse than if they, they grow. And so now you have a free range eggs because all of a sudden putting them back out in the wild is better than uh, having them in a pen. Yeah. And, and that's all that is, is that God wants us to be careful about how we treat our body. But let's think about it. It goes right on to even our, our entertainment. You know, when we start thinking about food, we're getting more pork, but let's talk about even entertainment. What we allow into our minds and hearts it has to be just, in terms of diet, we have to be just as strict about even right down, you know, one that people get conversation. We are not quick to end loose conversation. And God says, for every loose conversation, you'll be judged. And as Christians, you should not entertain mm -hmm. certain conversations. And those things are things that, and, and let me just be clear for everybody, I just being <laughs> yeah, but, thing about, <laughs> because I do not, I will, if I know that I'm, I will never try to push another brother <clears throat> away from God. 
<clears throat> when it comes to conversations especially, that's a perfect example <clears throat> of how you can push somebody back into sin. Right. <clears throat> because certain conversations will make them feel like it's okay for you to have these conversations, period. <clears throat> and then now, you know, they could even go back into their sinful nature. <clears throat> you understand? That's right. <clears throat> so, yeah, the, the food thing was just me being... And, and let me have a tip, Alex. Uh, you know, I have a lot of respect for the men in our church. When we are doing the joint service with um, St. Thomas Assembly of God, we can call the name, I help them set up, I preach, you know, that's an extra assignment. After we finish preach, we ate, it's time to cater. <laughs> I feel I had done enough. So I went to go play dominoes. That's the call, you know. I felt I was entitled to a little fun before I go home to get my nap. And bless Alkin Hart, he came to me very quiet. He said, Pastor Carl, um, no, not the time. <laughs> Remember he told me? He said, we're going to have these. We're going to have to help our brethren tear them. And what did I do? I said, you're right. I pushed the dominoes. I said, Alkin, you're right. And I, I went and I walked. And I even walked a little extra hard. Not of the guilt. <laughs> But that's where we, we have to submit to each other. But the fact that he was right, that as much as I may have been the one who preached and stay a while and prepared, that right now you have people trying to bring an end to the service. And I wasn't very much a part of that as anything else. And I owe an obligation to continue to lead, even though I felt like I had done enough. Does that make sense? And I'm, I'm just showing you how love works. So, and also his heart. So he was right. He, when, I, when I heard him, I said, you know, he's absolutely right. What if it was us breaking down and somebody else took that attitude? It, it would have not been viewed favorably. So, but but um, you, you have to be applauded as well for even receiving right. um, the directive because mm -hmm. somebody else in, in the position of pastor might have said, well, I'm the pastor you think he is, you know? But so, so you have to be applauded as well. And anyway, I could go on, but for the sake of time. <laughs> Uh, and so that's what that's what the scriptures mean. Yeah, what is exactly is that so much that whole idea of being stuck? That most of the confusion comes around people who see this eating and in a kind of religious way. Mm -hmm. And that's where the problem is. Because um one of my daughters, not one of my daughters, I attend the only one I have. My daughter does the pork. And Oftentimes they are home, spend weekends and so on. So sometimes on some weekends I cook some food. One she said I would cook pork. Because I don't that much you need one, two, three, four pots kind of stuff. My wife does that one. <laughs> so I don't cook pork. When she's there, I don't cook pork. But because because simply because uh, Although I never asked her exactly why she doesn't eat it. I said, I so that might be my Anyway, she chose not to eat it. So when she's there, I will cook it. Yeah. Right? So if I chicken, we find it. Okay. <coughs> I, I have I have it by the hand. So <laughs> she can you can whoever if I cook it. But I wouldn't cook up when she's although I'm almost convinced it's not a religious thing, but I don't do it. Because what's the point? I mean, people who, who are tied up in the religious system, I think it's even worse for them because then, you know, they see they watch you as though you did some great sin. It's only one of the great sin and this kind of thing. But, um, but even in that case, as what people say, well, just just for the, for the moment, for the night, for the weekend, you don't be looking. Nor is it going to make you any better whether you need it or not. So, so what? So kill the argument. Yeah, just, yeah. just leave it alone. Yeah, it's for the time being. It's true. Yeah. But I, I think it was first it's first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23 and onward. First Corinthians 10, 23. 23. We talked about it, about the believer freedom. It says that I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. Verse 24. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others, which is this love thing that we are dying tonight, right? Eat anything sold in a meat market without raising questions of conscience, you know, the and laws and everything in, right. which is what we were talking about, the pork or whatever, right? But it's that if an unbeliever invites you to a meal, 
and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered a sacrifice, then do not do it, go for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of your conscience. Because then you know now that you're not supposed to eat something that was sacrificed to another God. If you didn't know about it, you eat it, you're fine, right? Mm-hmm. But now you know it was sacrificed, you're not supposed to eat it, and you say, okay, I don't want it, you know? And I said, I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another person's conscience, which is our question tonight, right? right, right. If I take part in a meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, but do not cause anyone to stumble, whether they're Jews, Greeks, or of the church of God. Even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but a good of many, so that they may be saved. So now you can imagine trying to please everyone in every way. That's not, <laughs> that's not even impossible in his but that's his goal because of his love. His yeah. goal is that he, he doesn't want to prevent anyone from coming to faith in Christ. 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 Not just that, but all motivation. A lot of what he's talking about is different to what we're talking about from the aspect of we just spent a whole couple of weeks speaking about Jewish beliefs mm-hmm. and non Jewish beliefs. <clears throat> And not making you know one person feel bad based on a belief such as circumcision mm-hmm. versus today just some people just is they don't have no you're making them backslide from their belief they just don't that's it. they don't mm-hmm. you know so that's i like i actually like that it's a very good balance it's a good balance and those are the kind of guidance that paul gave us on how to live out our faith you know, and it's really, really, uh, as he said, like, you don't go for that weekend. It comes our obligation of love. Yeah. And what's his love is, I don't want anyone to die lost. <laughs> so me denying myself a right that I know I can have is not going to affect my relationship with God to prevent them from being so offended that they close their minds to the message of Christ. I won't do it. Yeah. Would that make sense? It's a record you're doing a good job advocating <laughs> by the Holy Spirit. I'll see you that We give God that we're having a really good conversation. I like yes. Bible studies for this because I think we're all we're all growing. We're all growing. Exactly. You know, the dynamic tension is what is allowing us to grow. Uh, someone has a I, I wonder if I could. If I could make a comment, and um, I have been listening uh, intently and thought that I would just listen um, and enjoy the discussion. But I, <clears throat> I want to go up to the upfront part because one of the things that we tend to do in Christendom, we tend to look at weakness or meekness as one of weakness. And we have to be cautious when, and note where the Bible speaks of iron sharpness, iron. One has to know their limit when I do hold to the truths of love. That's one of the, that's the, the, the prime commandment that we love one another. Which means we, which also means we care for one another, but we have to be very cautious and careful that in the process that your faith can become eroded. I speak out of um, experience, and I'll share this one thing, and I shared it with my 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 children, uh, particularly this morning, where I was talking about even men of people of the cloth Hmm. I recalled some time ago and this is one of many occasions but there was this one that it was at a point where I almost wanted to walk away from the faith when someone particularly a particular visiting minister had inquired about staying at my resort at a special rate. 
and I did make the arrangements and inform the particular minister of the charges, what the charges were. And when the minister on checkout, he said to the, those at the front, Chris is taking care of my charges. What? Chris is taking care of my charges. And I'll tell you the truth. I had to sneak home. My wife take care of all the expenses because, you know, she's good at controlling monies. I had to go and take my credit card to save face of the, for the gospel sake. 750 US dollars that I had to spend. And you know, it took me a couple of weeks. I thought, I mean, the guy spoke, was a good speaker, the guy. And then, you know, I said, let me call him and tell him what, what injury he did. But, you know, I paused and I almost like, I don't think I really want to be a part of this faith. This was about maybe the, 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 the end thing that would have happened. But then, I began to think about the cross and Christ and my salvation and my faith. And then I had to reevaluate. And that's how I had to move on. And building up my, myself in the most holy faith, I had to dig deep and reach in. And then finally, I had to confess to my wife what, I, what happened. You know, because the charges will come on the, on the, on the, on the credit card. Um, no, I do, I do not pay if I stay at the hotel. It's where I work, so I don't have to pay. So she would ask, oh, why are you paying this money? Why? So I make sure to clear it. But it, it could have destroyed even that relationship. And, you know, I, I thank God that my wife also eventually, she was hurt over it. And we both went through it. And we had to build up our faith. And she would say to me, she said, no, Chris, listen, even worship. I was like, I said, Sandra, I'm not sure I could even entertain bringing people in anymore. This thing, even though I've experienced God, but you know, like I said, this was one that, and then I had to re evaluate. And <laughs> God then toughened me. And then in terms of spirit of discernment, I, I had to learn that. And then I had to watch out. And then I'm, I was able to teach others. But then I remember where Christ talked about with, 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 with Peter. Satan did I say for wheat, but when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Well, it was where I now began to strengthen persons and say, you know what? No. And, and to teach others that you have to be careful. You have to watch it, that your faith will get damaged. Yeah. Um, and persons can come with sweet talk and, you know, and it can be from the pulpit and elsewhere. And today, and only today, I spoke this morning and today a young girl spoke to me similarly about these things. We, are, we have to be so cautious. We have to use wisdom in all that we do and make sure there are certain persons that we're going to have to drop off. That on the train tracks, we're going to have to say, you know what? I am sharp if I am, but you know, it's, 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 it, if you're not grinding with me, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to let you go. So it's good that we teach it. However, there comes a point where you're going to have to let go or as you can damage yourself in the process. I just wanted to mention that. So we give God time for you as little. We're going to pick up after that. But, uh, you know, that, that shows you why we have to test every spirit to see who of God. Mm -hmm. And why Paul tells us we have to face things based on certain mindsets and attitudes in terms of abuse. There's a lot of abuse that people do, uh, even in the Lord's church. And so having that discernment and not being just caught up in giftedness in terms of the gifts that operate in. Because gifts are given without repentance. Um, that... We have to really look for the fruit of the spirit and not just the gifts of the spirit. And why I teach the way I teach, because I do believe that at the end of the day, like Paul says, let's have preached to others, let's have led people into the presence of God, let's have done all these amazing things based on the gifts God gave me. I myself, 
be a castaway because I was not careful about how I look. So we give that time. We had really, really good participation as always. Uh, but tonight was very, very dynamic. Uh, a lot of intelligent, bright thoughts that helped to add substance and depth and, and dimension to our conversations. So it's not one dimensional that's just come from me as like a lecturer. So I give God thanks for that. I see our online audience is growing and our in-house audience is growing. So let us continue to persevere and not grow weary. Um, I said last week we we're going to get to chapter six, but we're to the end of chapter five. Where we're going to speak about I've also not being enslaved to sinful indulgence, which is that that our redemption also wanted to free us from ourselves, from 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 the law of sin as well as the world, the worldly influence. And we're going to get a little bit more to that next week um, as we continue on. I give God thanks to you and let us close in prayer. Is there any um, prayer requests uh, that we should be mindful of? Sunday is Mother's Day. We are excited for all of our mothers. Uh, we want to give God thanks for our mothers. Bless our mothers. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness in raising our children. And as you can see, you know, mothers do an amazing job sacrificially, uh, giving of themselves, sometimes denying themselves for the benefit and the welfare of the children. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you in God's house on Sunday. Uh, we're having discussions among our leaders as to how we can make it special for you as you come. And so we're looking forward to that. But before that happens on Thursday, we want you to fast a little bit so you can fit into that mother's dress on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> we pray at 6 a.m., 12 noon, at 6 p.m. <laughs> That's not a focus of fast. I was just trying to be sick, really. <laughs> can we pray for our... Um... Our children, our youth, yeah. and, not, and not our biological children, but their children, period, as they make decisions, even if particularly those who have accepted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and now are going through that peer pressure stage or phase of their lives where they want to fit in and not realizing that it's, it's, it's not of God. So if we could just... Um, Pray for them and just pray that we as adults would be more involved in their lives so that they would have, um, what's the word that I want to, to use? So that we may, we may be examples, spiritual examples to them and that the lives we live would be one that they could actually see Christ within us. Yes, yes, yes. We have we had confirmation for that very quick. I don't want to. We're just going to focus on that. Well, Father, we love you. We thank you for this amazing privilege to live out our faith in this present world. We are by no means discouraged. We thank you for the spirit of perseverance that there is no desire in us to quit or to give up or to give in to the prayer pressures of the circumstances around us. We are still excited and hopeful about the age in which we live. We do believe that you're returning for a victorious church. We do believe that in these times, we're going to see the coming in of the harvest in the latter day rain, uh, the abundance and the multiplication of souls being birthed into the large church. We continue to pray ourselves as we grow into Christ-like spiritual maturity in our faith so that when you bring in young believers, they're not offended or crushed or even um, pushed a way of push down, um, help us to really uh, emulate and as possible be examples of this amazing faith that you have entrusted to us. We pray for our young people. <laughs> we are aware of the uh, awesome burden of prayer pressure to conform, to fit in, um, to imitate and mimic the world. And when they do it, Father God, they look out of place, um, even like Peter hanging around the fire when Jesus was being crucified. But even in that moment, you said, Peter, we prayed for you. Yeah, even when you fall, we're praying for you that when you're restored, you're going to be an asset to the church. And we saw Peter preaching the amazing gospel on the day of Pentecost and bringing in 3,000 souls. Help us to have that heart of Christ. As we say to all of our young people, to our children, all of those that we're leading, we believe in you. We believe that God has great plans for you. We are praying for you that after you've been tested and after you've 
been tried in, at every point, as we know that life will test and try them, that they will come out as pure gold, that the anointing of God will rest upon them, rest upon the giftings that has been placed in them as birth. We get manifestation, a revelation from Jeremiah, from the womb you are anointed and gifted to bring the message of deliverance to the nation of Israel. We believe that about our children. We believe that about all those that are being saved. We pray for those, Father God, who are even growing up in families that don't preach our faith, where they are alienated, where they're not shown love. Father God, we really pray for those young people who just have everything stacked against them. We are praying, oh God, that we will have to illuminate their darkness. May our love, may our kindness, may our goodness towards them just uh, break up, follow ground, soften their hearts so that they can see God as their Heavenly Father and that they can be open to um, your love, the love that you have shown them from the cross. We pray as we go our separate place that your anointing will forever be upon us. I continue to pray for your servants, those who have been steadfast in season and out of season. May you be kind to them. May you be kind to their household. May you establish your covenant with them for a thousand generations. May your favor be for life. May you anoint and prosper the works of their hands. May you bless them with our father Abraham that they in turn will be a blessing and an encouragement to the people of the earth. I bless them, Father God, as we leave this week, both from our online presence and both from our in-house presence. And may you continue to be kind with us and may you continue to fill us and fashion us into your amazing love. Build our church on love. Build our church on forgiveness. Give us hearts that are united as one so that we can be conduits for the glory and the outflowing of the gift and the person of the Holy Spirit. I bless your people in the mighty name of your son, Jesus of Christ, and all God's people say, Amen. 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 Love you all. Love you much. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the contributions that you bring to our Tuesday night conversations. And I'll see you on Thursday morning for our, our prayer. Good night. God bless you all, everyone. Have a good evening's rest now. Bye. Good night. 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 Good